Mark, you are um, your visiting research fellow at the University of Bristol, as well as the senior scientist at the Humane Society International. But in particular, you have a long lasting experience about work to protect whales and dolphins, in particular within the International Whaling Commission, but also within various other fora. So um, I I'm really interested to learn from you what are the current hotspots of, in particular, the small whales and dolphins being directly hunted across the world. Yes, thanks for that. Yes, I'm the senior marine scientist with the Humane Society International, and um, I've spent um, more than 25 years in the meetings of the International Whaling Commission, mainly working through its, um, through its scientific committee. And I think it's probably worth noting at the beginning that the Whaling Commission was established as the body to control whaling. And it was established back way back in 1946 as pretty much the uh, first attempt to manage a living resource on an international basis because the whales, of course, were so incredibly valuable and countries were finding it difficult to maintain their yield, to maintain the, the removal rates that they wanted. So the Whaling Commission has traditionally focused on whales. And as you know, in 1982, after many years of, of debate, uh, they decided to put a moratorium, a ban on commercial whaling. And because the focus had mainly been on the great whales, that's the big filter feeding species and the sperm whales, that ban, which is in reality a series of zeros in a table, covered just those species. But it didn't cover what we often refer to as the small cetaceans. So cetaceans is this um, now infra order of animals, which has all the porpoises, all the dolphins, all the beaked whales, uh, and all the big whales, the great whales, the filter feeding whales, the sperm whales, those are all included in there. And there are around 90 species. So that ban on commercial whaling, which is certainly a huge conservation success, covers those species. It hasn't been a perfect ban, as we know, but nonetheless a big success. And, and there's some recovery going on, particularly in humpback, some humpback whale uh, populations. But in the meantime, we have ongoing hunts, ongoing removals of other species. And uh, these most famously, most well known about are probably um, uh, Japan's uh, infamous take, which has featured in films and documentaries, um, which is not limited to taiji, which is what we normally hear about, where the take is partly for meat and partly for captive animals. But also in other Japanese prefectures, these smaller, generally smaller whale and dolphin species are also taken. And then we have hunts elsewhere in the world, as you know, in the Faroe Isles, in Greenland, um, and in one or two other places as well. So that means that um, direct hunts take place. And, and you mentioned Japan, but you also mentioned now um, other regions. and. So is, is, it, is it driven by meat consumption? So what are the main purposes from your take, for example, also then in, in, in Greenland or, you know, because probably people know about Japan, but probably not about Greenland. So, so what, is, what is the driving force behind the hunts there? Now, these, are, these are really good questions. And I think what would surprise people is probably the, the scale of takes that are still going on in this sort of what we might call the wider European area in which we would include um, Greenland and the, and the Faroe Islands. And so over the last 10 years, um, something like 10,000 pilot whales, um, two and a half thousand white-sided dolphins, and people are often surprised to find that dolphins are being hunted as well, and an incredible number of almost 22,000 harbour porpoises, which is a very small species, um, have been taken uh, in just the, in, in this last 10 year period. And as I understand it at the moment, 
these hunts are predominantly about producing meat. These are, these are hunts which are to put meat on the table uh, of people for them to, to eat. Uh, there is also an element, I think, across the whole of the whaling issue of proponents of such hunts, of proponents of whaling saying, this is also to do with managing our marine ecosystems because these animals, these marine top predators, which they certainly are, eat fish. And therefore, if we remove them, there'll be more fish for us to eat. And that kind of argument rarely, really holds up in scientific terms, but it's quite powerful politically, as we've seen all over the world. It's also been applied to the, to the big whales. And I think at the, at the root of your question is, is what is the propelling force behind these things? I think there hasn't been enough uh, research that's really gone on into what's happening in Greenland, despite the scale of it, for us to have a very clear view there. Uh, but we do know that in some uh, areas, in some parts of the world where whaling is conducted, that it's not to, simply to feed local communities. And this is where we get into a very difficult area. Oh, yeah. I see that, Mark. Um, the consequent question for me would be that you raise quite huge numbers. And we know we talk about low reproductive animals, and we know that we talk about animals exposed to various threats. So I imagine that you must be truly concerned about ongoing hunts. So would you elaborate a little bit about these continued hunts also in context to other threats and the concerns you have about them? I can try and do that. I mean, we, I think we need to look at these hunts in two different ways. So first of all, we use the lens of conservation. So do we think that there's a threat to the populations that are being hunted? But then, because we're talking about intelligent, sentient animals, animals that can think, animals that know about each other, animals that live in family groups and typically help each other in those, in those families, family groups or other cooperative uh, elements of society, we also have, I think, this moral responsibility to think about that aspect uh, as well. So attempts are made in most of the hunts of whales and dolphins around the world to say that they are sustainable. So this is the conservation focus. So that, uh, the, the theory is that there can be a removable offtake, a removable number of animals the same approach that is taken to fish fisheries. You can remove so many and the population will remain and the population won't dwindle. Now I have to say, my experience and my knowledge of this is this hasn't been a big success for fish fisheries. And so many fish fisheries have not really done very well. And typically fish, not all fish, but, but many fish that are focused on their populations have more ability to recover because their reproductive rates are much quicker and they don't have the same kind of issues with the fact that they're trying to, that they actually exist in social groups, cooperative groups at relatively small sizes, you know, to begin with, which would, for example, be the case with um, orcas, which are, which are hunted um, in Greenland. Uh, so, we have to be concerned about sustainability and that really gets a big, big red flag when countries are conducting hunts and they don't have any attempt to calculate any sort of sustainable quota um, and that would apply to some of the takes uh, in Greenland and then of course there's a whole level of complicated horribly complicated technical debate about whether or not these takes are sustainable, who's calculating the figures, whether the data that are being fed in, which are predominantly to do with population size, um, are adequate to the task. These are very, very hot debates. And then just coming back to the Whaling Commission, the Whaling Commission has never set quotas for the small cetaceans. It's never attempted to do that. So these quotas where they exist are either being set nationally or they're being set by other bodies. And I think that that whole thing requires, that whole approach itself requires some critical examination. 
to test whether or not these things are actually impartial and appropriately done. So that's the sort of conservation. It's a quick run through the conservation arguments. I think on the other end of it, from the welfare point of view, and the suffering that these hunts can create and the effects on the individual and on the groups that they are involved in. Obviously, we need to be concerned about that uh, as well. You know, we can't dismiss these animals as not experiencing pain and not experiencing grief and loss as well. There's good evidence of that too from these animals. So we're in a world where the environment is changing rapidly. So climate change is changing the nature of water bodies. It's moving prey around. And the whales, dolphins and porpoises are starting to show signs that they're responding to that by moving their distributions. So that's one big concern. The most immediate concern worldwide is probably the incidental capture of these animals in, in fishing operations. And that's very major. It's a very major issue uh, in Europe. Uh, we have a critically endangered porpoise harbour porpoise population in the Baltic Sea, where fisheries are, are probably the main threat to it. And then we have quite large removals of dolphins going on out in the wider northeast Atlantic area. And the last time we had any sort of estimate on figures uh, was quite a few years ago. But hundreds of thousands of animals are killed in fishing nets worldwide. That's, that's for sure. That's the case. So... If I relate this back then to the hunting issue, say we have these pressures, we have climate change, we have bycatch, we, have, we also have other threats like pollution and noise, which are less easy to put figures on, but we shouldn't think in any way are insignificant, and it may depend on the species and its particular vulnerabilities and what it's being exposed to. So we have all these factors which will be affecting the populations. The one thing that we could easily address is not to hunt them. That's a very convincing, convincing point, Mark, in terms of what could be, e what is the threat that can be easiest removed and taken away from, as a pressure, from those animals. Um, and and recently, um, you have been you've been advocating and coordinating an initiative um, which was in response to looking at the status of whale and dolphin populations and species around the world. So, and you've taken an initiative forward, which is science driven based on scientific knowledge. And so what is, what is the, the, the heart of this initiative and what is the core message of this initiative, Mark? Yes, Nikki, thanks for asking about that. So we've had a, a scientist sign on statement um, uh, of concern about cetacean conservation. And that really came out of discussions back in May at the scientific committee of the International Whaling Commission, which for obvious reasons this year was a virtual meeting was held by Zoom and other platforms, which was very interesting. But what was very clear there, and there was a very high level of participation, which was itself an interesting byproduct of the way that we were, this meeting was being conducted. Um, what was interesting there was, was there was a lot of concern and um, there was a discussion which was largely led by Michael Stakovich, who I know you know, who is uh, an academic uh, in Vienna. And uh, he was leading a discussion about how we, how the Whaling Commission might better prepare and better respond to populations and species that are approaching extinction. And what was Apparent in, in, the, in that discussion was a lot of researchers around the world were really concerned about what was happening to the populations that they were looking at, particularly a lot of young researchers. And it felt like if we could give them a voice, they would be pleased to say something. And so this idea of a statement of concern was born. And the statement, which is based largely on the red data list that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature maintains and regularly updates. That statement notes that more than half of the world's cetaceans have conservation statuses of concern. So more than half of that 90 or so species um, have concerning statuses. Several of them are critically endangered. And, and it was also in part uh, precipitated because the North Atlantic right whale uh, 
had just been moved by the IUCN on its red data list to the critically endangered, the it's just about to go extinct uh, status. So we drafted something, we redrafted it a few times with a team of, of experts, and then we started to circulate it, and then we redrafted it again as people came back with comments and amendments. And uh, in the end, it's still open as we speak, but it has more than 350 experts from all around the world signed on to it uh, from more than 40 countries. And it's aimed at the policymakers to say, we're being too slow. These animals are going to disappear unless we take better action. And this um, statement was talked about, reviewed, presented at the Conservation Committee of the International Whaling Commission, which met just a few weeks ago. Also at the meeting of Azkabans, which as you know is the regional agreement in Europe for the smaller species of cetaceans, and hopefully is being heard elsewhere as well, you know, by those people in positions of influence who can help ensure that proper conservation plans are put into place with follow-up, and most important of all, with enforcement. And that's the lacking element in Europe and the lacking element, I think, across much of the world as well. Well, first of all, thanks for the initiative. I think it's critically important. In, in terms of a little bit of reflecting on it, you stress there are numerous threats out there. Um, a large amount of species and populations are impacted, but you also stress the need to protect individual and the social groups. So not simply depending on the numbers still around. Um, so this brings me back to this introducing um, point about the moratorium, which is not applying to the large amount of species of cetaceans, but just for the larger species. So the question is, wouldn't a ban of direct hunts be the step forward? And is that something you would like to see in the future happening? The reality based on their biology is that all cetaceans, and there's a great variety of different life forms and life histories, but I think all cetaceans are inherently unsuitable for efforts at sustainable utilization of them. Long lived, slow breeding, intelligent social animals, low replacement rate. So even if we dismiss the, the moral, the ethical issues, they are just the wrong species for people to be trying to, to utilize. Now there is a very difficult um, area of discussion around this, which is to do with the rights of people to live, to do with how indigenous communities, some of which hunt whales um, and other cetacean species, how they live, and whether or not there are alternative food sources or alternative uh, ways that they could maintain their societies. And that's a really, really hard discussion. Uh, and I think that we need, you know, the conservation and welfare community needs to look anew at some of these hunts and try and work out a better way forward. I think that's a beautiful bridge to, I think, a very important point, not just from a philosophical perspective or a legal rights perspective, but you're also one of the, the people um, out there in the scientific world and the conservation community thriving this new concept of whales and dolphins of culture. Um, would that be a paradigm shift if we accept that these animals have culture to change our um, way forward and how we deal with them? I mean, there is good news in all of this, Nikki, and, and I think that, you know, the cultural component in conservation is starting to be recognised, and we've seen that happening most particularly at the Convention for Migratory Species. So looking outside the cetacean world to their terrestrial counterparts, the primates, at the last meeting in February, the uh, chimpanzee, a chimpanzee population of uh, West Africa was recognised based on its culture and extra protection was given uh, to it at least in theory that's the agreement anyway so that's uh, we're in the early stages of, of seeing how that will be implemented and that in fact followed on behind 
recognition of, of um, conservation units for sperm whales in the, um, in the Pacific, the South Pacific area, where their different cultural units are, de are defined by their differences in calls. They have different dialects. And the theory behind all of this, of course, is that if you can protect, if you, if you protect the cultural units, you make the species itself, the wider population, more robust. But in order to do that effectively, where you have animals that have culture, and maybe we should talk about what culture actually means in this context, um, you end up with a more robust system, a more effective system. If you ignore it, you lose the culture. And I'll give you one example. So, and this will help in terms of explaining what culture means. So many of the whales, as you know, are highly migratory and they move between feeding grounds and breeding grounds, um, mainly probably on, a, on an annual basis. The, whale, the whalers knocked out, historically, whaling peaked, whaling on the big whales peaked in the 20th century, but somewhere between 60 to 90% of all whales were removed. And of course, these are, you know, slow breeding animals, so they haven't replaced. But what would happen? What happened at that time was that whole cultural units were certainly removed, and this means that whales have not come to re-inhabit areas where they were totally removed, because there are no whales that know how to use that those areas, and they have not been shown by existing whales the migration routes where the food stuff is, how to find their way. So those distinct units are, are lost. Okay, that's um, emotional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think it is. I mean, I think, you know, these animals are, are remarkable. And we, you know, we knocked them for six for commercial gain. I don't know whether that, that mm. uh, phrase works. You know, we removed them. For commercial gain, we mined them, we mined the seas and just removed enormous quantities. The biggest removal of biomass living material ever has been done was through whaling. So that brings me just to the final point, Mark. Um, it's just asking you whether there is any personal um, vision or hope, wish um, that you would like to see as the core core. Um, way forward to be achieved in the coming years that would really make it a better world or better oceans for whales and dolphins out there. Is there something, if there is one point you would like to mention? Yeah, I think most of these animals are transboundary animals. I mean, they don't belong to particular countries. And so what that means is that we need international cooperation. I'm a big fan of international cooperation. I've spent, you know, the better part of my career trying to work within international bodies to improve things, which is why it's been so painful to see a drift away from that in some, you know, very well-known quarters. And if we want to save the whales, dolphins and porpoises, and they're not saved at this point, we need to have that international cooperation. Some of that will come from International Whaling Commission, which has been reforming itself into a modern conservation focused organization with great work streams looking at incidental capture in fishing nets and trying to develop mitigation for that example and work, uh, for example and workshops on climate change the convention for migratory species i've already mentioned and there are other important international bodies where countries need to get together work out some plans and then fund them properly and then enforce what is agreed but I think international cooperation for transboundary animals is absolutely vital. And so investment and focus and effort in those arenas.